coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. There is no better way to kickstart our afternoon than with the world's fastest land mammal here in the plains of East Africa. This is Wild Wonderland. <laughs> Absolutely magnificent. This is happening, folks. This is 100% live. Here we are. We're watching the migration story unfold. Here's a lion. There's a lion right next to us. Oh, that was close. You can't possibly script something like this. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show. My name is James Hendry on camera as always. Enormous James, you can see he's using the other finger today to hide the fact that his gloves have got a hole in them. We're sitting here with the magnificent migrating herds and they're heading down south. Now, we're in three locations in Africa, the Masai Mara of Kenya, which is just to my right-hand side, the Serengeti of Tanzania, which is just to my left, and way down to the south, the Western Kruger of South Africa. Now, quite interestingly, these herds are, have turned out of the Masai Mara and they're moving back into Tanzania. Now, if you hadn't been around this area and you didn't know the actions of these herds, you'd think that the migration in the Mara was over, but you'd be wrong. They swirl around. They'll go into Tanzania, they'll turn around, they'll come back into Kenya, and they'll do that probably three or four more times during the course of this migration season. Now, remember, you're the most important part of any live safari, so please do talk to us using the hashtag C CGTN Wild or the hashtag Wild Wonderland and that is on Twitter. Hashtag CGTN Wild or hashtag Wild Wonderland. The movements of these herds have baffled and amazed human beings for many hundreds of years. The red oat grass plains of the Mara Serengeti sway in anticipation. In February, Around 400,000 wildebeest are born on the short grass of the Serengeti's southern plains. Just half an hour, the calves have found their feet. And one of nature's greatest journeys begins. From the southern plains, more than a million animals move northwest into the Serengeti's western corridor, massing on the banks of the Grumeti River. As the rut ends, the herds gallop north once more. Eventually, two million grazers arrive to feast on the abundance of the Masai Mara. It begins with the trickle of the zebra vanguard, enjoying the undisturbed long grass plains, making the first crossings of the turbulent Mara River. Many fall to the rapids and the crocodiles. And then comes the main body of the migration, the thundering herds of white-bearded gnu bleating songs of chaos in search of green pasture. The herds know the danger, but the call for food is too great. All must take the plunge. Not all will make it. For those that do, hungry prides and clans patrol the banks. For survivors, rich red oat grass is the reward. Before it's time to cross the river again, as nature's greatest herd follows the life-giving storms and verdant plains of the Mara Serengeti for nourishment. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome again to the Mara Triangle, where we are once again, as we were this morning, with the Salt Lick Pride. And here are not two but three little cubs that have just come out to mum and they are quite thirsty it has been a very warm afternoon and i think they have been just hiding underneath this drainage culvert under the road my name is steve falcon which joined by Jandre on camera how incredible is it to have scenes like this in front of us we watched and we followed this female this morning as she investigated and found this little drainage culvert under the road, something that the lions and hyena of the Mara like to do. They like to hide their youngsters in 
these man-made structures underneath the roads which are here to facilitate the movement of water otherwise there would be very inaccessible areas so if they make use of it it's a nice safe place there you can see she's testing some urine on the grass you see she's doing what we call a phlegm grimace we had two of these females meeting up with each other before and sniffing and then lifting their mouth open to test the scents which all go to the brain indicate all sorts of reproductive things but let's quickly take you down to south africa to the sabi sands where lauren is about to lose a female leopard Welcome everyone to the wild wonderland that is South Africa. My name is Lauren and I do have Seb on camera and believe it or not right now we're trying to follow and keep up with a female leopardess who's 13 years old. Her name is Tandy and she is very difficult to keep up with so what we're going to do is just navigate our way through the thicket here nice and carefully as she's stalking, she's hunting, she's hungry and we've got to try and do our very very best to keep up with her because of course this is live with CGTN and we're just gonna have to hope for the best her name does mean a loved one and she is an absolute stunning leopardess and I really really hope we get the chance to show you to her she's a lot slender and smaller than the male leopard oh I think we've got a view hold on can you do that Seb yes we finally got a view of Miss Tandy so as I was saying, she's much slender and smaller than the male leopards around here. She really won't weigh nearly half as much as them. She's very petite, so she can just navigate her way through all the trees, shrubs and grass. And she is not easy to keep up with. Sorry about that. There are other vehicles in the sighting, so I'm going to do my very best to keep up with her. And while we do that, we're going to send you guys back up to David with some elephants. Very well done, Lauren, and how lucky to see uh, that uh, leopardess, which is always described as the queen of that area. Well, we don't have a cat as yet, but we have the largest mammals in the world, and we got the African elephants. And look at that huge number of elephants there, both the big and the small, and the green grass, which definitely they are feeding on. And how lovely is that? Well, my name is David and on camera with me this afternoon is Bungay. Bungay, how are you doing? And we're both very excited to bring to this CGTN uh, Wild Wonderland show. We are on the other side of the Mara and I'm sure you all know we are coming to you live as you go back to our elephants one more time and just look at that huge cow there. I'm sure my friends have already told you that we like to share your comments. We love hearing from you. Should you have any questions, please send them through on Twitter using CGTN Wild or you can use Twitter Wild Wonderland on Twitter. It's a huge cow there and this bird in front of her, which is a heron. And what she might be trying to do is to get some insect if that elephant is going to move any insects there she just said it to pass the heron and the elephants continue eating well we are going to stay here because we've got a very huge herd of elephants coming towards where we are but in the meantime we'll take you all the way back to south africa to my friend jemmy who got one of the big five all right well in the meantime while david waits for his elephants to get a little bit closer not to and to keep him entertained we are sitting all the way halfway across the continent with a herd of buffalo and at the moment most of them are feeling very very thirsty welcome to cgtn's wild wonderland my name is jamie and behind the camera is craig and we are sitting a couple of meters away from a buffalo herd actually on exactly the same termite mound that I started this series on we've got bulls we've got cows 
We've got a number of them scuffling over space, and they're all spread out in this golden light. And this is my favorite thing about being on foot, is it just feels that much more intimate. I can smell the buffalo. They smell like dust and cows. I can smell their dung, and I can enjoy the beauty of the golden light. Of course, buffalo potentially can be very, very dangerous. I've touched on this before. They might look like cows, but they are absolutely not. And one big buffalo bull is around about 900 or so kilograms. All right, we're going to send you across to Steve because nothing is cuter than a tiny little lion cubs. Thanks, Jamie. Be careful now. On foot, it always amazes me the size of buffalo. But when you have a look at how big this girl is, she's right next to us. She is enormous. Now, when lions take buffalo, they normally do it in groups. They do it with males around. And sometimes you think, how is it possible? But when you have a look at the size of this girl, she is incredibly big. Weighs about 140 kilograms. Uh, it can weigh a little bit more than that, in fact. Females, so what's that? 280 pounds, 270 odd pounds. That is a lot. That is a lot of weight for taking down large animals. And she is here with her cubs. She is a fierce protector. Sherry, this is very precious. We are right here. She is actually underneath us at the moment. The culvert goes under the road, and the three smallest cubs are still in there, and the three of the others, the five-month-old ones, we've seen one came out of here a moment ago covered in mud, and I don't know if the other two are in there as well. There's a couple members of the pride around. One of them is looking towards the distant herds that are slowly grazing in a long line. Who knows? They're being very vocal. She might stash them here, tell them, Stay here, little ones. Don't go anywhere. And she might go off with her sisters to hunt the endless herds of a wildebeest on the horizon. If she does, we'll be following. Because this time of year, they will choose wildebeest and zebra over buffalo. But buffalo are here all the time. And uh, so they will choose them when times are tough. Okay, well, it's not only the wildebeest we see many of in the migration, always following the herds, are the masses of vultures. There are a few vultures here, and we are still definitely in amongst the herds, and you, as you could probably hear. And what we have here is two interesting kinds of birds. We've got the vultures, but also we've got a large collection of what I think is the world's ugliest bird, and that is the marabou stork. Now, very interestingly, if we zoom in on the ones on the right-hand side, please, James, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, that one, that one's just as good. You can see its legs are white. Now, their legs are not actually white. Their legs are, in fact, gray. In fact, that's a perfect one because you can see that the left leg is gray and the right leg is white. Uh, other way around and that is because they defecate on their legs in order to keep cool so it's been a hot day today around about 27 28 degrees celsius and even hotter if you happen to be standing in the sun like that bird has been and so what they do is they defecate all over their legs in order to stay cool which i think is a rather uh, repulsive practice but it seems to work well for them and if you look at their heads it's not exactly like they are the prettiest birds in the world, are they? They have this sort of downy feathers on top that looks like they've had a bad haircut. And they're actually extremely effective scavengers. So they will fly and occupy much the same niche as the vultures do. They've got a different kind of a beak, though, and so they can probably feed on greater volumes of meat, but they won't be able to get at the meat in between the bones and the sinew and that sort of thing with their big heavy bill. But that big heavy bill does help them to defend themselves and to fight off other vultures. Isn't that cool? And then just to the right hand side we've got the rest of the herds coming out of what I think is one of the most 
beautiful valleys here in the Masai Mara. We're going to explore this valley. I've never been up here before. I'm hoping to find some lions. While we do that, let's go back down south where these wildebeest are heading towards Tristan. Well, good luck, James. I hope that you find your lines and you have a good exploration of your valley. Now, when James was sitting with those vultures, we were just thinking about this poor cheetah who we spent some time with today. And unfortunately, this cheetah lost its kill to vultures, which might sound surprising to many of you because it's a big cat and you wouldn't think birds would be able to push it off its kill. But cheetah are very slightly built. And often if there's enough vultures, they'll actually just abandon the kill and move away, which is exactly what happened. And it's why he's having a bit of a rest. His tummy is quite full from the impala carcass he had a little bit earlier. My name is Tristan. On camera, I've got David this afternoon, and it is a very, very warm welcome to the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. It is a beautiful place to be on safari and to be spending it with the likes of cheetah always makes it that much more special. Now, this particular cheetah is an interesting one. It's not part of the same cheetah we saw yesterday. Yesterday, we had a coalition of two males. This cheetah is also a male, but he's a much, much younger individual. And we saw him for the first time a few days ago, about, I think it was about four days ago, and he managed to hunt and kill an Oroby. And then I believe that yesterday, or yesterday before yesterday, he was seen on another kill and then today on a Impala. So he's had a serious amount of food over the course of the last four days. It's why that tummy is so big and round and he's seemingly doing very well. Now we say he's a young male because if you look on his tummy area, you'll see that it is very very fluffy and then on the back of his neck area which is not easy to see at the moment because of the grass but there's tufts of fur on the back of his neck now you can age cheetah with that because when they're born they have this long fur on their back and it goes from their head all the way down to their tail and it just helps with their camouflage in the grass um, and as they start to grow older so that kind of mane if you want to call it that starts to get shorter and shorter and so if you compare the two boys we had yesterday afternoon and this young fellow over here you'll see that there is a very very big difference in the length of their coat particularly behind the ears and on the back of the head now i think our cheetah is probably going to have a very very sleepy afternoon given how full his belly is so we're going to probably start making tracks and see what else we can find in the area in the meantime though let's send you back across to south africa where the queen tandy well she's moving about So Tandy is definitely keeping us on our toes here. She's hungry, that's why. It's getting a little bit later into the afternoon, but it still is very hot. She's on the move. She keeps stopping, listening. Look at her ears. She keeps assessing what's going on around her. And she keeps twitching her tail. Look at that. Now, I don't know what she sees and hears because I don't have senses like hers, but she definitely hears something. Look at her body posture. So she is going to hunt. I don't know what and I don't know when, but Tandy Girl here is absolutely on the move. James is very happy that we have another big cat trifecta today, absolutely. There's such a high leopard density here in the Kruger Park in South Africa. There's actually more males than there actually is females. So it's really, really nice to get the chance to show you all Tandy was a female leopardess instead of a male, which we always tend to bump into. She's on the move somewhere. So Tandy also gets called the Queen of Juma. Let's find out why. Queen Karula reigned at Juma for many years. But she disappeared. Leaving Tandi, her only remaining daughter, to assume the throne. Tandi is a wizened 12-year-old of grumpy character and superb skill. She's taken on the old queen's mantle, defending her new Juma territory. In November 2017, Tandi gave birth to Princess Tlalamba. 
If she's fortunate, the young leopardess will be the third generation of this royal lineage to call Juma her realm. However, the young princess faces many challenges before her territory is safe. There is constant pressure from other leopardesses eager for space. While Tandi has fought off many threats until now, the queen is in the twilight of her years. It remains to be seen whether she still has sufficient strength to hold on to the throne until Tlalamba comes of age. Every other leopard got different characters and it's like today, as Lauren said, we've got lots of cats today, cheetahs, leopards, lions, but personally I thought I would stick with the big mammals and I might keep my voice a bit soft because we are surrounded by elephants where we are and you've got two of these youngsters that are trying to scratch their trunks and their mouth with that fallen branch. How cute is this? Two youngsters there and you can see the one on the left it's a very tiny so small baby elephant and the mothers are just next door not very far they're keeping a watchful eye to the young ones and what they'll do they just scratch their trunks they scratch their mouth day that becomes very smooth because what would happen is if there's any pulse itchy, that's what they do. And I'm looking at that fallen tree. Should you just maybe put your tongue through it, you're not even going to get a single blister because it's so, so very smooth. Look at this young one here, just trying to put her trunk up. She's moving maybe to the first cousin. My guess is this could be two or three families of elephants together. And I agree with all of you that this is a very, very cute family. Very cute baby rather, who is just playing about. Not sure she is even able to eat, but just following the adults. And you've got also two youngsters there who are having a play fight. They just stopped. And how lovely is this? You see one there that got mad looks a bit darker than the rest. Simply because where we are, we're in an area that got some mush and the times they'll always submerge themselves in to just make sure they cool their bodies off this is lovely i'm not going anywhere let's go fast to the side of the mara with some lions that are calling And you are back with us at Egyptian Goose Pan once again. We are with the Salt Lake Pride. And this lioness stood up and did a little beautiful cat stretch. Downward facing dog. And then called herself to the afternoon. It's a little bit early in the day you'd think to be calling. Because the air temperature or pressure is quite high. Which means it doesn't travel as far as it does in the early morning. But I think she's trying to rally the troops. She definitely looked like she was hungrier than the female we were with before. Hello, giraffe girl. You want to know about the male that was here this morning? Well, he is still here, but he's flat, flat, flat in some long grass up against the pan. And after some confirmation... We're not 100% sure because we haven't managed to see him again, but it actually seems like he might be one of the pride males. He might be one of the males from the sausage tree pride, one of those young boys. Um, but we need to get another good look at him. Um, there's an ear I need to look for, but at the moment all he is is a furball in the long grass, but I'm sure he's going to get up soon and maybe he'll actually contribute with these lioness, lionesses in catching bountiful prey that we can see in the distance. She's making a noise again. She 
calls. And then looks over longingly at where the rest of the ladies are. Come help me, I'm hungry. She knows it's easier as a group. The herds in the distance are in relatively short grass. Which makes it very difficult to stalk them. So they need to rush in and grab something. And having numbers is much more sort of successful than on your own. The herd in many, many numbers, many eyes to view the predators. Although it is actually easier to catch them in such large groups than in smaller groups. Because they almost think like everyone else is watching out and they all get complacent anyway a group of animals that is never complacent david is still with his beautiful herd of elephants yes it's true and i'm talking of a group of elephants here which you'd call a parade of elephants and as much as you know the migration is around especially where james is my other corner of the Mara, I still got the elephants. They have moved a little bit further from me. Can you hear that? Steve had lions that... That's all trumpeting and rumbling. Steve had lions that Ali were calling, my elephants are now calling. It's very normal and this is how the animals will always communicate and socialize by vocalization. You can see how they spread out all the way in the green area and it's what I thought, there could be a few different families together. That young calf there seems to be suffering to me. Did you hear that? That was just a youngster or a teenager. Hear that? We got, of course, other people not very far from where we are. And I think he was just trumpeting to get a vehicle which had some very loud gas. And this is all what we get in the African wilderness. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, should you have any questions, you may send them through. You're seeing hashtag CGTN world or hashtag wild wonderland. Apparently, elephants are my favorite animals in the whole of Africa and they have wonderful stories. Bye. Perhaps elephants fascinate us so much because they display the social complexity and full emotional range of our own human species. Mothers, sisters, Cousins, aunts and calves live in close-knit herds. Cows live in the same herd from birth until the grave some 60 years later. For peace and prosperity, the herd is led by the oldest, wisest female. She is protector, but cantankerous disciplinarian when necessary. With their flappy ears, floppy trunks, and folded skin, baby elephants are some of the cutest animals in nature. Like toddlers, they are playful, curious, and love the mud. Human voices and our funny vehicles provide huge amusement for brave little bulls. But while exploring and playing is a daily priority, mum's protective embrace is never far away. Well, how fantastic are elephants. They really are a very, very special animal and their social structure is absolutely incredible. Now, there is no better way to celebrate the migration with CGTN Wild Wonderland live show than to be in the migration. As you can see, we've got a bunch of zebra and wildebeest all around us that are snorting 
and making a lot of noise. Now, it looks very peaceful. It looks absolutely beautiful with the mountains in the background or kopis as they're called in this area. But there are dangers that lurk here and one needs to be very, very keen-eyed to be able to see the dangers that do lurk because in this area, the hills have eyes. Now, I want you to pay attention to the top, top, top of that rock because what you will see there is the belly of a lion that is sitting all the way on top and it is absolutely amazing that they can get up there that is a huge huge rock and it's sitting up there for a very good reason there's two reasons why that lion is up there one is because it's getting away from all the flies when the migration is around there's a huge influx of flies that develop in the area and you get covered in them and so for the lions it's very 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 unpleasant and so they get up there to be able to get away from it the other reason that they go up there is that it is the perfect vantage point to be able to scout out their area now from up there she will be able to see this entire herd that is spanning behind me she'll be able to watch all the zebra and wildebeest that are moving around and she can plan what her evening is going to be and I'm pretty sure this evening we're going to find her hunting because the zebra and wildebeest haven't actually spent much time in this area and you can see that by the fact that the grass is still quite long now, Lauren, are there any different antelope that only occur in this area, so in the Serengeti, in, in northern part of the Serengeti? No, so there aren't um, animals that are only, only found here, but there are a few special animals that we don't see in South Africa and that are a little bit rarer in the Maasai Mara, and so Orobi is one of them. Um, you also do to get dictic in this area, which is another nice little antelope. Um, and so those are the two really, into, and clipspringer actually. Now clipspringer is an animal that also lives in amongst the rocks and seems to be much like the lions and spends a lot of time on the rocks. And we'll hopefully be able to show you what a clipspringer looks like. We're going to try and get closer to that lion just now. And maybe on the way there, we might pick up a clipspringer on one of the rocks that we'll be able to show you. They're one of my favorite little antelopes because they are very different to many of the other antelopes in their behavior and they are wonderful to watch as they negotiate these rocky outcrops. Something else that is wonderful to watch is some of the beautiful birds that occur out in the East African Plains and sounds like James is with one of those very pretty birds. Look at these little things, they're called little bee eaters. And we are sitting in the most perfect oasis in the middle of the migration. The bee eaters are above a wet stream. And above the bee eaters, there is one of Africa's most favorite animals. There he is. He's a Maasai giraffe. And he's one of the only animals to be really not much affected by the migration. My name is James Henry. Big James is on camera. You're watching, of course, CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show. And it's a huge privilege to have you here with us live from three African locations. Let's go back to our giraffe friend over there. I say he's unaffected by the migration because he doesn't eat grass. And so, whereas everyone else's grazing is covered in wildebeest dung and urine and in fact just covered in wildebeest and zebra this chap is not at all affected he walks along these gorgeous streams eating the leaves off the trees and is an extremely healthy individual you can see that he's got no lesions on his skins and that's how, on his skin and that is how we discern the health of a giraffe isn't he gorgeous and just behind him, you can see all of the migrating wildebeest all coming down towards the south to where we began our drive. We've been heading north since the beginning. And when they get into those long lines like that, it's then that you realize they're on the way somewhere. Often you'll find small groups of 10 or 20 moving, but in a big line like that, it's very unusual uh, that they will turn on and go the other way. Ravinda, you're wondering about carmine bee eaters, stunning yeah, uh, birds of uh, say four or five different kinds of red carmine bee eaters are found largely in southern Africa and I'm pretty sure they're not found up here actually I'll just quickly check for you no they're not found up here up here so you'd find them oh no you do you do find the northern carmine bee eater just not in this particular area as far as I'm aware no so you don't find them up here you do find them in the eastern parts of Kenya.
Isn't that fantastic? Oh, that's just beautiful. All right, we're going to enjoy our oasis just for a little bit longer. You're going to go back down to South Africa to meet the grumpy and terrifying queen. Our lovely leopardess, Miss Tandy, a.k.a. the Queen, has decided to take a breather and I am so grateful because I also need a breather too after all that following I have been doing. So for those who have just joined, my name is Lauren and I do have Seb on camera and this is a 13-year-old leopardess known as Tandy. We have been following her for about 30 minutes now and she's been looking interested in many different things out here but obviously nothing has quite taken in her fancy. Leopards stalk, they rely on camouflage, they're ambush hunters, so they need to remain unseen. So she'll assess the situation for a little bit longer and then of course once her prey comes into the right distance she will launch her attack. But many many leopards out here attack time and time again and it does not always result in success. But they're very resourceful animals and this leopardess here can probably eat a huge variety of prey from small reptiles even to fish that have died and washed ashore to bigger mammals to insects all sorts of creatures i think leopards are known around the world to eat around 92 different prey items they're absolutely incredible at being resourceful and of course opportunistic now we see many cats sleeping out here but do not be fooled just like my dog at home, as soon as you open that biscuit tin, she's wide awake. Or as soon as something walks by, Miss Tandy here would be wide awake. I like to call it the biscuit tin effect. Absolutely no relevance in science, but this cat knows exactly what is going on. So we're going to chill a little bit longer with our spotted cat, but send you guys up to East Africa with a different kind of cat. Thanks, Lauren. Well, as your leopard sleeps, our lions have all become awake and they've all accumulated together here by the pan. The male is very close by as well. We'll show to him to you shortly. You see one of the lionesses has got her head up. They've all come to have a drink. That one on the right of the screen has got her head up. I'm not going to show you now, but a herd of wildebeest is off to our left and they've just come out of sort of the back of the fields over here. My name once again is Steve Fulgham, is joined by Jean on camera. How exciting is this? We've got the whole Celtic pride together. Um, all the adults, a male, and and three very small cubs, and three five, six month old cubs, and they seem to have spotted that herd of wildebeest that are moving very slowly away. We're going to stay here where the action is. We're not going anywhere. Let's send you quickly down to South Africa where Jamie has got a leopard on foot. Uh, there's action here too, although it may not necessarily look like it with a sleepy leopard. But we have left our buffalo on foot and we are now meters away from one of the biggest cats in Africa. There is a leopard sleeping probably around about 15 or so meters from us as they're sleeping. He's sniffing the air, he's very relaxed, and this is what is so special about Hosanna. <clears throat> There are so few people, and I mentioned this a couple of shows ago when I was on foot with Hassan, and there are so few people who get to have this experience with a leopard on foot. They are notoriously shy animals, and you're watching it right here and right now live. Now, my name is Jamie, and the man behind the camera is Craig with Nerves of Steel, and that is Hosanna our little boy, and moments like this we cherish every second of because as he gets older and as he reaches a territorial age, he's not going to he's not going to let us get any closer or get this close for much longer. Gemma, you want to know on the subject of leopards and perhaps Hosanna's movements, uh, what 
which animals would migrate if it weren't for the fences in the Greater Kruger. And the answer to that is, look, the Greater Kruger is an enormous area, but there would have been animal movement and things like elephants. We actually don't even know how far the elephants moved once upon a time, depending upon rain and depending on where water was available. And once upon a time in South Africa, we had a migration that rivaled the great migration of East Africa, and that was the migration of the springboks. But unfortunately, with the fences throughout the country, and that did not necessarily include just the greater Kruger, but a fair portion of the country itself, He's sniffing the air. I'm sorry, I'm giggling slightly because it's unusual to be so close to a leopard and watch him behaving in a way that uh, tells us he is completely relaxed. I have to admit, my heart jumped into my mouth a little bit when I saw just how close he was. Uh, well, we sit here with one of our favorite leopards. Gigi, across in the Maasai Mara, has found one of his favorite birds. That's very true, because uh, you remember Alia said my favorite animals are the elephants. Now, this is the favorite anim uh, bird of David and the lilac breasted roller, and wonderful for Jimmy to get that close to Hosanna, a very favorite bird in that particular area of Kruger. Well, for those of you who could be joining us now, I don't want to be very loud, this bird doesn't fly away. Or oh, for those of you who might have got my name, my name is David and on camera with me is Bungay. Now this bird here is called the Lilac Breasted Roller. And I would say it's my most favorite bird because it is very colorful. She looks small, but she got anything between seven to eight colors. That bird you see there. They're called rollers because apparently they mate while in the air. It's always very difficult uh, to tell males from females. They're almost identical to get their sexual dimorphism. It's very difficult. Unless you get two together, then you can have an idea. Because ideally, the male is slightly bit larger in size than the female. Rikanda, that's a great comment. You say you love the colors, and I'll tell you what, that's why I say it's my favorite bird because it got so many colors. And if you see it in flight, it's even more cuter. Lilac breasted roller. And this is a very great cooperative she has given us without flying away. Sometimes they are always very skittish. I'll just leave her and move on. Hopefully we'll get something else. But in the meantime, we'll go to James, who's still got the hearts of Wildebeest. We've got a little mini crossing in process here. They're crossing a stream, the Wildebeest, but you can see how careful they are and how weary they are of coming down into the stream and out again. And you can multiply that by about 100 when it comes to crossing the great gushing Mara River. They're all coming from the same direction and they're thinking about the green grass down in Tanzania for some reason at the moment. You might just be able to hear them bleating at each other, the youngsters. Take care, that's a, a very difficult question to answer in a short amount of time, but I'll do my best. Basically, the migration is not as ancient as people think it is. It's only about, uh, let's say, it's only probably about 60 or 70 years old in its current form. We don't know if animals were migrating in this area for long before that, but we think they possibly were. But up until around about the turn of the 19th century, so, you know, the early 1900s, so turn of the 20th century, sorry, this area was all cattle and people mainly and so this migration didn't occur then there was a big disease that swept through the area it killed all the cattle all the people moved out uh, all the bush came um uh, what else happened then oh yes uh, and eventually through that process the animal wild animal numbers started to increase again the bush got quite a lot thicker and the tsetse fly came in which meant that the people didn't come back with their cattle but the wild animals could survive then the elephants returned and they cleared out all the thick bush 
and by then the area had been established as a natural park, as a national park, and apparently the numbers of wildebeest and zebra and Thompson's gazelle and the other species that migrate have been relatively consistent since about 1975 or so. So it's only been since the late 50s, early 60s that the migration routes that we're currently seeing have or were established and the numbers have been about the same since 1975 or so. But what is really interesting about that is that, of course, there's no written record before the 1800s or so. So we don't know what was going on before the Maasai came into this area with their cattle. And it's quite likely that animals were migrating because they just seem to slip into the pattern very easily. We're going to continue from here up north about only five kilometers or so. Steve is sitting at a little water hole. Well, thanks, James. Well, indeed, we have now correctly identified this male here as being one of the younger males that moved away from the sausage tree pride last year. Him and his brother, you see that nick in his left ear and gives it away. And, uh, well, now we've had a good look at him. One of the youngsters that's just behind him braved the swampy area and came to say hello. But male lions don't like cubs playing with them. The cubs just want to play and bite their ears and jump on them, but he took quite a bit of exception to it and growled a bit and snarled, but the adults didn't get involved. So the youngsters, you see the size difference there, eight weeks or so on the left versus about five months, four and a half, five months. Uh, last time I was in the Mara, the five-month-old cubs looked like these ones, very playful, very inquisitive and they were playing and jumping all over the adult males who weren't very excited about it and actually moved off a bit of a distance. See how it's interested now. It wants to go do what its older cousin has done, but it needs to brave that muddy wallow there. Hello, Lamech. You want to know if I'm scared being close to lions? I must admit that sometimes they get quite close and they look right through your soul and that never gets old that feeling uh, but years and years of experience of lions has, has taught me not to be afraid of them um, in the vehicle they don't see us as it's very strange really they don't see us as the human form they get quite relaxed to the car and you can get quite close to them but on foot lions see there we go there's the fifth lioness come to join in she's got a very full belly i think she might be the mother of the, oh, she's a bit snarly. Oh, there we go. I think she might be the mother of those three older cubs. Okay, well, we're going to stay here with these lionesses and these cubs. Hopefully, they'll get up and do something soon. And let's send you back down to Jamie on foot again with the little chief. I have to tell you that while Steve might be waiting for his lions to get up and do something, I'm hoping that Hosanna stays exactly where he is. I really cannot stress this enough. The fact that he is still comfortable enough with our presence to let us do this is utterly extraordinary. And uh, to use one of James's favorite words, he is extremely confiding in our, with us. He allows us at this distance, and he, he doesn't change his natural behavior. He's not ducking down, his head's not back, his ears are not tucked behind his head. Everything in this cat's body language is relaxed. His breathing is completely normal. There's absolutely nothing that it would tell you that he's being watched by three human beings on foot. Admittedly, three human beings that have known him since he was very, very little. This isn't something that we take for granted, though. He is still a wild animal. We always know that one day we could catch Hosanna on a bad day. So we're always very, very careful with him. But his camouflage is such that we so often end up stumbling across him. All right, well, speaking of a leopard that never stumbles, Tundi's about to descend. Indeed, Tandy never stumbles. She has just gone up a tree, had a little look around, came all the way back down again and plonked herself on the ground here. Of 
course, leopards are famous for hoisting kills up trees. You can even see her shoulder blades there, just how big and powerful they are. And that's why they're like that, so that they can climb all the way up trees, stash their kills there, and keep them out of reach of nasty hyenas or lions that may try to steal her kill. All predators out here scavenge from one another. All the top level apex predators will try and pinch the foods of another. Not just leopard, not just hyenas and not just lions. But Miss Tandy here has quite a reputation, not just for being grumpy occasionally, but for also being an absolute expert level hunter. Tandy's superb camouflage is most impressive in the sparse winter vegetation. Her colours blend with the subtle golds, bronzes and greys. On an overcast and windy morning, the riverine woodland is an ideal place to hunt. There's cover in the understory. Her spotted pelage and silent, careful footfalls disguise her approach. Her speed and agility do the rest. The queen has an enormous and deeply unfortunate scrub hair for breakfast. It's amazing to watch Tandy on the hunt. I must be honest, she is a very calculating female. And after spending the better part of sort of eight years following her around, I've been lucky enough to have witnessed her hunt on many occasions. And she is incredibly clever about the way that she does it. Now, you can see on top of the rock there, this is where our lines are. It's actually not one line, it's two lines. And what's interesting is it's the exact same place that yesterday morning we had mating lines, but it's a different female. Same male that we had mating yesterday that was posing so beautifully on Pride Rock, as we were calling it yesterday. But the female has changed. This is the female that doesn't have the tail. Now, for those of you that have just joined this CGTN Wild Wonderland live broadcast, my name is Tristan, and it is a very warm welcome to the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. Now, David has spotted something above my head, which is a vulture as far as I can see. Yes, looks like a vulture. I can't see which species at this stage, just given the sun is behind it, and so it's more a silhouette than an actual vulture that has color so it could be white backed or ruples it looks about that size the lapid faced is slightly larger than that so joshua how's the leopard action in tanzania well joshua very very good um this morning unfortunately we missed showing you a leopard by about five minutes um our leopard gave us the slip after about an hour but we've seen leopards fairly regularly um in terms of individuals i think we're on about seven different individuals that we've seen since we've been here um and most of them quite relaxed we've had lots of leopards up in trees it's actually been very very pleasant we even had mating leopards the one day which was really nice so they are around and where we are now is a good place to look for them anywhere where you get these rocky outcrops they like to hang around in these sections and they don't really sit on the rocks as much as the lions do what they do is they use the trees very very close to the rocks so you see there's some big trees that grow out a lot of them are are called rock figs um, and they'll actually climb up into those for the exact same reason I was saying earlier with the lines is more to get out of the way of the flies and also to get up into a breeze where it's a lot cooler during the course of the day. We're going to sit here and be patient because if they mate on that rock it's going to be quite something and so while we do that let's send you across to David with a very very large bird. Well, it's very true, uh, Tristan, should those lions meet on that rock, it will be very special. They're some of the largest rocks we got in East Africa that we call the copies. But I left my lilac breasted roller and ended up with the largest bird in the world. And these are the common ostriches or the Maasai ostriches. Now, earlier I was talking about the small, beautiful bird we saw, the lilac breasted roller, and I said how difficult it is sometimes to tell males from females. Now, for this ones here, it's in black and white. You can comfortably tell the difference of the males and the females. I'm going to back up a little bit so that you can have a chance 
to have to see how different the males and the females are. Bungay, hold on. Bungay is the cameraman today. Tell me when to stop, Bungay. You come in. So we want to show you the big difference between the males and the females. Keep coming. Are you, are you happy? Keep coming. Okay, just one second. And this one gives us a better chance to have a look at these ostriches. And it's one male and three females. If you look carefully, and you can see the male is black and white, whereas the females are grayish brown in color. That's the major difference between the two sexes, unlike the lilac breasted roller that they had before. And how huge birds are. And if you look carefully on their legs and necks, the bear, they do not got any feathers. And of course, that one helps them to cool. And they are the only birds that you have here in Africa that do not fly. Speed is important to them, but also James, who got wildebeest, he also knows how important speed it is to the wildebeest when migrating. Now, it's quite difficult to tell the difference between male and female wildebeest unless you see them standing together or unless you see behind their legs, and in which case it's quite obvious. But the bulls uh, end up much bigger than the cows when they're fully grown. Everything is calming down here nicely. The sun is bathing the valley we were in in a sort of last wash of golden light before it goes down. And it just feels like the wilderness is calming down after another frenetic day in the migration. It's a wonderful feeling. It's the perfect time to settle and just sit and watch. And perhaps if you've got a favorite tipple to have that on your lap, well, you appreciate the magic of this place. Right, let's quickly go back to the south to Tristan. Now you can see our lions have just unfortunately finished mating, or maybe not. The male's going in for a second round on top of the rock. Isn't this just... Can you hear that? Now I don't know if you could hear them. They were making noise on top of theirs because they were busy mating. It is absolutely unbelievable to have them mate on top of a rock and it's incredible to be here and to be able to see that it's one of those things that often as a naturalist or a guide you want to be able to see and the guide that is actually driving us around here in tanzania has been guiding for 20 years and he said to me that yesterday and well today is the first time that he's actually seen them mating on rocks like this which is absolutely spectacular it gives you an idea of just how rare it is to be able to see these guys do it now unfortunately i think the few Females moved a little bit and that's why the males facing away from us at the moment he's not really in the greatest of places and I'm hoping he's gonna turn you can see his kind of mane as he moves look at that isn't that magnificent that is absolutely amazing now he's gonna lie down after all that hard work wonderful right now that was an incredible experience to see but Steve is still sitting with an equally incredible experience as he has the trust of a mother suckling her cubs Indeed, the circle of life starts with, obviously, the male and female the mating. And then we get the females with their cubs, like these ones, busy suckling. Different pride, obviously, all together. But the males don't play any part in parental care. And they basically defend the pride, defend the cubs, their lineage going forward. And you can see they're all very flat now. The afternoon has cooled off. A little bit which is quite nice you'd think um, we hope they would have gotten up but they seem to have decided it's nice and cool now to just enjoy a little bit of slumber in the cool green grass below and the cubs have decided it's a good time to maybe get out in the Sun as well and the suckle it was too hot earlier mum was calling them from their shelter to try get them to come out they came out twice but only for a very short period of time and then went back in it was a bit uncomfortable for them and now they're enjoying the peaceful afternoon, completely oblivious, the cubs, to the herds in the horizon. And it seems as if the lions themselves are going to wait until the cover of darkness to then maybe make an attempt 
on those wildebeest because not only do they use the prides as sort of members to catch, they'll also use the long grass if there is, and if there's no long grass, they use the cover of darkness. Cheryl, it has been a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for joining us. A lovely, lovely drive indeed. And there is Mum. Her head is up. Maybe she's had enough of the suckling. Well, a very good afternoon we've had. Don't forget, this is only episode six. We still have half, more than half a week to go. And we thoroughly look forward to bringing you more of the migration from the Serengeti in Tanzania, as well as here in the Mara Triangle in Kenya and the leopards down in South Africa. Thank you for joining us. From myself and the rest of the team, have a beautiful evening. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock EAT.